Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Shelley Wilkinson, Director of Sales with Tricom. We're pleased to introduce our Industry Insider webinar series. The purpose of the series is to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. Our presenter today is John Walters. John is currently the VP of Business Development for Insurance Applications Group, LLC, the company that designed and markets the Essential Staff Care Benefits Program. John was hired eight years ago as the Director of Business Development, and since taking that position, ESC has dramatically increased its client base every year to make Essential Staff Care the largest benefits program for temporary agencies in the nation. Now with over 500 staffing companies as clients and over half a million temporaries enrolling annually, ESC has been recognized as one of the fastest growing businesses for, for Inc. Magazine's 500 of 5,000 for the last three consecutive years. ESC has also been awarded both the Golden Eagle Award and the Soaring Eagle Awards over the last three years from the National Association of Health Underwriters. In today's Industry Insider webinar, John will review the fundamental aspects of healthcare reform, strategic considerations and action steps that need to take place prior to the end of 2013. By the end of this session, you'll have the information you need to implement an action plan to successfully navigate healthcare reform. If you have questions during the presentation, Please utilize the chat feature located on the right toolbar and submit questions to all participants, all panelists. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, John. Thank you so much, Shelley. Uh, great with, to be with everybody today. Uh, uh, like Shelley just mentioned, today is going to be a little bit more like an ACA 101 for everybody. We are going to cover a lot of the basic aspects of the law, um, uh, in, including some of the important calculations that you have to consider. And then we'll uh, dive a little bit into some strategic considerations toward the end, and, and like Shelley said, uh, open it up for some questions and see if we can be of service. Um, Shelly did a great job already on who we are, probably should uh, uh, update a little bit. We hit our 600th staffing company as a client earlier this year, so uh, continue to growing at a very large pace. Um, do have to offer a disclaimer here. This is the I am not a lawyer speech. I am an insurance professional, so uh, please, when seeking advice uh, for your specific and unique business uh, based on your market and the area of the country you do businesses, uh, business in, we highly recommend that you seek out your own legal counsel or accounting uh, uh, counsel for advice for your specific business. All right. So today we're going to cover, like I said, a lot of, a lot of the basics, uh, you know, calculating whether or not you're a large employer, and if you are, how to figure out which employees are eligible for coverage, um, some, some considerations to keep in mind when deciding whether to pay or play, and then we'll cover some other information like information on public and private uh, exchanges, uh, strategic considerations, and uh, some basic action steps to take prior toward the end of the year. From there, so what are your next steps on how to prepare? Step one for everybody, are you an applicable large employer? Um, the general consensus out there that most staffing firms will be considered a large employer just based on the nature of the business. And of course, of anybody that uh, is deemed to be a small employer at some point, you may, uh, I'm sure, uh, are wanting to be a large employer. So we'll spend some basic uh, uh, time on this calculation, um, how you figure it out, especially if you're one of those companies that are very close to the 50-person threshold. All right, so first let's go through a couple of def definitions here. One is uh, the ACA uh, formally defined, and in its own way, what a full-time employee is. Uh, it's much different than some of the other interpretations uh, uh, through Department of Labor and some other issues there. So the ACA actually has its own definition of who a full-time employee is. And basically that is any employee who averages 30 or more hours of service per week in a given calendar month, um, or basically anybody who does about, on average, about 130 or more service hours for any given calendar month. There's also a, a, the concept, especially for the large and small calculation, and it, it, it is, uh, only applies to this calculation, it is the conce uh, concept of your full time equivalent. Um, very confusing because obviously uh, both 
uh, uh, descriptions would use the same uh, abbreviation FTE. So be very careful there. That seems to have caused a lot of confusion out there for employers across the country. The difference between an actual full-time employee and what's considered a full-time equivalent. Um, basically keep in mind the full-time equivalence definition is only for this particular definition of whether or not you are a large or small employer. Once you get over that hurdle and, and have it in your head that one way or the other that you are a large employer, then you will focus on exactly who will be determined your full-time employees. So your full-time equivalence is basically you're going to add up all of your non-full-time employees, cap everybody's hours at 120 hours per employee. doesn't matter if you have anybody go over 120, but you want to cap uh, anybody that is 120 hours. You add up all hours in a given month, and you divide that number by 120. That will give you the number of full-time equivalents for that particular month. So basically, you will do that calculation for each given month, and then, of course, take the total and divide it by 12 to come up with a yearly average of full-time equivalents. If you are, based on that calculation, if you are 50 or more, you are an applicable large employer. If you are 49 or under, you are considered a small employer and therefore not subject to the ACA provisions. Um, Going forward, this calculation will need to be performed uh, each year to determine your status for the following year. And for this year only, you can either use the entire year of 2013 to uh, do this calculation, or you can use the last six months of this calendar year. Uh, but for this initial year, prior to everything kicking off in January 1, 2014, you can either use the full year or the last six months of this year to determine your large or small employer status. All right. So basically, you know, um, uh, here's some calculations that are basically provided uh, straight out of the IRS notice and, and their examples. So we won't spend a whole lot of time on a lot of these uh, case studies I have list, listed here. Um, you feel free to go through these and look at some of these examples uh, uh, afterwards uh, just to basically run some numbers there. Um, so we'll just go ahead and continue on. All right, uh, and basically, again, this is an actual example from the IRS notice, uh, but it's basically how to perform this calculation. But basically, you're just going to add up everybody's hours, capping everybody at 120, uh, get up the, with that total of hours, divide that number by 120 to get your number of full-time equivalents for that calendar month, then, of course, do it for every month uh, for a given calendar year. So we'll skip uh, some of these various case studies uh, and just uh, have those there for uh, to give you some examples to look uh, look after uh, after the presentation is over. Now, in this count, should I count my seasonal workers? Uh, the answer to that is no. Um, employers should use a good faith interpretation of the Department's labor's, uh, Department of Labor's definition of what a seasonal worker is. Uh, most staffing firms should, of course, already be aware of who their seasonal workers are based on previous classifications. But basically, if the sum of an employer's full-time employees and their full-time equivalents exceeds 50 for 120 days or less, Less, and the employees in excess of those 50 during that period were seasonal workers, then the employer is not considered a large employer. So basically take your true defined seasonal workers out of your calculation. You will also take any 1099 or independent bona fide contractors out of this calculation. So you're only going to be worried about uh, really W-2 employees except for your seasonal workers. All right. So um, let's say you have multiple divisions there uh, in a company, or you're thinking about uh, splitting your company into separate uh, companies to avoid the PPACA. You may still be subject to the law. Um, the IRS has definitely uh, notified everybody that they will be looking at, looking at that. So uh, all employees of a given control group defined by the IRS are taken into account in determining whether the members of the group together constitute, uh, constitute an applicable large employer. Um, 
each member of the group would then be considered a large employer member. And while there may be benefits to disaggregation under the proposed regulations, this is a strategic consideration that you should obviously discuss with your legal counsel or CPA before looking at going this well, route. Um, the IRS is certainly aware of this, and they do not seem to be very flexible on a lot of these uh, determinations. So please make sure if that is something you're looking at doing to get uh, solicit the appropriate advice before doing so. All right. Can I avoid the law by using a PEO? Well, um, the ACA does use the common law standard uh, to determine who is the employer. And of course, this is going to apply for all businesses, not just PEOs and staffing companies. So everybody is going to be treated under the common law standard to determine who the actual employer is. In short, uh, uh, as most of you are well aware of, an employer must be able to direct the employee as to the work to be performed. That is one of the facts and circumstances, uh, a test, uh, that has to be applied when determining who the common law employer is. So under co-employment relationships, the staffing agency is the common law employer, while the PEO generally provides only administrative services to that staffing agency. So a PEO cannot direct the employee to do anything and thus cannot be considered the common law employer. You, the staffing company, will. Make sure you're also looking at issues such as this based on your contracts with your own clients. Make sure you have the proper protections and processes in place um, that makes sure that there is no ambiguity out there uh, on who the common law employer is for your own employees. Uh, uh, one of the big mistakes and one of, uh, we think, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of time is going to be spent on focusing on is uh, what's going to happen in the staffing environment with their clients. Make sure that uh, you know all of your processes and protections are in place so there is no uh, disagreement, there is no question on who the common law employer is in these relationships. All right. So you are a large employer. So we're going to take step two. Obviously, if you're under 50, you could probably hang up the phone right now and say, shoo, I don't have to worry about anything. But for the rest of you or those who think you're going to be over 50 full-time equivalents uh, in the very near future, um, you're going to be a large employer. So your next step is to focus on which employees are eligible for coverage or therefore eligible for penalty calculations. The first thing you need to focus on after you make your large and small employer calculation is who will be your current ongoing full-time employees as of January 1, 2014. And this is where we get into the look-back rule. All right. Every employer can use a either 3- to 12-month look-back period called your standard measurement period, to determine if ongoing employees were employed full-time during that period. So what that means is basically the majority of the staffing industry, everybody seems to agree that the longest possible look-back period will be beneficial to a staffing company because that will help minimize the true number of full-time employees. And your ongoing employees as of January 1 are determined to be is basically if you're going to use a 12-month look-back period, it would be those employees that work for 12 months this year, 2013. All right. If your employees work all year long and do in excess or at 1,560 hours over this 12-month period, and they are still an employee on January 1 of 2014, those will be your current ongoing full-time employees. Um, each employee must average at least about 130 hours of service per month during that measurement period, which will be 2013 is what you're going to be looking at for January 1, 2014, for those folks to be considered full-time. So depending on which 
amount of time you use for your look back period. Again, the majority of the industry believes 12 months will be more beneficial, but uh, based on your individual facts and circumstances, the individual market, you may decide to choose a shorter period of time, and it's certainly your right to do so. So basically, if your look back period was three months, you would have to look at 390 hours, uh, 780 hours for six months. But again, most everybody is going to be doing the 12 months and looking at who completed a full 1,560 hours. Uh, we, of course, recommend the 12-month period um, because we think that's everybody's best chance at possibly reducing the number of full-time employees uh, based on this definition, which, of course, uh, is, is a direct result of what your penalties or coverage options uh, would have to meet. All right. Also involved in the look-back period, is what's called an administrative period. This is uh, only going to be needed if you are indeed going to be offering coverage through your full-time workforce. Um, you may use up to a 90-day administrative period after your look-back period, and you use this period of time to determine which employees were full-time and should be offered coverage. Uh, keep in mind there's one little twist to this, and again, it's only going to uh, apply if you are going to use some type of play strategy going forward, is that if you use a 12-month look-back period and want to use a 90-day administrative period, they cannot uh, they would have to overlap because there is a particular rule in the regulations that should someone be determined to be full-time and coverage is offered, their benefits must be affected by the 13th month. So assuming a 90-day administrative period and a 12-month look back, we would, uh, uh, you would have to start that administrative period about month 10 of the 12-month look back. All right. After your look back and administrative periods take place, you then have a, a, a what's called a stability period of at least six months, but it can't be shorter than, this, than the original look back period. So if you're going to use a 12-month look back period, you have to have a 12-month stability period. Now, the, uh, the way the, uh, what the stability period is, is basically it is, since the IRS looks at it, they gave you the look-back period to help minimize the number of full-time employees in a temporary staffing environment. Well, based on that determination at the end of their 12 months, if that employee is determined to be full-time, then they must be treated as full-time for the full 12 months of their stability period following that. And basically what that means is, you know, regardless of their actual hours. So if someone works 1,560 hours during your look-back period, you determine them to be full-time, the pay or play will begin immediately. But for that entire year, uh, while that employee is still an employee, you must treat them as a full-time employee regardless of their actual hours. Okay, but the reverse is also true. If someone is determined to be not full time after their uh, initial look back period, then they're treated as not full time for the full 12 months of the stability period, regardless of hours. All right, so full time employees must be offered coverage during that stability period, but also remember that they cannot go longer than 13 months total before uh, their benefits are actually effective. So part-time employees do not have to be offered coverage at all during their stability periods. But again, that determination would have been made in the prior 12 months of their look-back period. So here's a little chart for everybody to kind of look at to put it all together. You basically pick a standard measurement period, a look back period of anywhere from three to twelve months. You must, uh, you can have an administrative period of up to ninety days, but again, uh, not going longer than that thirteenth month for effective benefits if you're going to use a play strategy. And then your stability period must be at least six months or whatever the length of the standard measurement period is. Uh, in, in case of a twelve month look back, a twelve month stability period. So here again, here's a couple of case studies. Uh, uh, again, examples directly from the IRS uh, regulations. These are probably not the easiest, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, examples to uh, go through uh, and read. But again, so we won't spend a whole lot of time on these examples, but uh, these will be for you to kind of look over uh, if you didn't want to have to dig through the actual regulations and look through some of those examples. 
All right. So we've gone over how to figure out who your full-time employees are after as of January 1. So the next step is how do you deal with new employees as they are hired uh, beginning in January of next year? All right. So this is basically where the definition of a variable hour or non-variable hour employee comes in. Um, basically on that employee's start date. And this is something that we're uh, you know, encouraging our clients and all staffing companies out there is, again, another place to tighten up on your, pro uh, on your protections and processes, and especially in your documentation. Uh, uh, you need to make sure a lot of focus now is going to be uh, put on uh, the new hire process because it's very important on how and when and, more importantly, who you can use a look back period uh, 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 assumption on. Um, again, that, the look back period is only for what's deemed as variable hour employees. A non-variable hour employee is either going to be a true full-time employee or basically a true part-time employee who you don't have to worry about paying or playing on. But you must look at the facts and circumstances of their start date. And from that a person's initial assignment, is, is where you determine, and it should be documented thoroughly what that initial assignment is, um, if the employee is reasonably expected to work an average of 30 hours a week. That is your first test, okay? If they don't work on average 30 hours a week for their assignment, then they are immediately a variable hour employee, and you can subject them to a look-back period. But if that assignment is full times. Uh, is full-time employment 30 hours a week or greater, then you must look at the proposed length of the assignment um, because there, this is where the regulations get a little unclear and there was not a bright line definition uh, on this. Um, basically, the way the IRS regulations and the way it defines this question is if an employee, assuming that they're going to be 30 hours a week or alone, but it's on a short-term assignment, and they kind of define short-term as three months or less, if the assignment is three months or less at full time, they are a variable hour employee. And so you can subject them to a look-back role. The IRS specifically said professional, technical, other type of assignments that are generally full-time and longer term, and they kind of specifically mentioned uh, contracts that are six months or longer, would not be deemed variable hour. So make sure you're looking at your contracts there. Um, the, the two things you know for sure, if the assignment is full-time in less than three months, you can make them variable hour. If the assignment is full-time in six months or longer, they will not be considered variable hour and therefore you could not subject them to a look back period and the pay or play must begin immediately. It gets very questionable and gray at the four to five month assignment length because they're not specifically mentioned nor is uh, it uh, defined as a bright line in the IRS regulation. Everybody kind of assumes that you will be okay to uh, uh, classify those employees as a variable hour and therefore subjecting them to a look back period uh, on those assignments. But uh, just know that the regulations did not define this very well. The only thing you're clear on is if the assignment is three months or less or six months or longer on this determination. When this uh, assignment gets to about four to five months, that is not specifically addressed in the regulations, and we do not know for sure if the IRS is going to revisit that. So uh, that's why we're just going to encourage everybody to uh, start documenting everything. And, of course, the IRS has specifically mentioned that their assumption is going to be that the majority of temporary employees employees will be variable hour employees and can be subjected to a look back role. Um, also, the question is, is how uh, stringently we, uh, uh, this may be enforced. So uh, our encouragement to our clients is make sure, especially in your new hire process, that you're documenting everything as thoroughly as humanly possible, uh, just in case there is an audit later on and you may have to defend your classification of, of these employees. 
All right. So again, here's just a basic little uh, chart there. Um, you'll start at basically, can you determine that the employee is going to average 30 hours a week or more? Um, you know, uh, if they are considered full-time and the assignment is short-term, you still can make them a variable hour employee. But if that assignment is full-time and for quote unquote long periods of time, then that is a, a pretty clear clear case that they are non variable and therefore will probably be a full time employee. All right. From there we'll continue. The other issue that you have have gonna have to be aware of in using look back periods, the variable and non variable hour, hour classifications is a new proposal that came out earlier this year, uh actually toward uh December of last year, where uh the IRS defined break and service rules. And this will particularly apply to those employees that are deemed a variable hour and subject to the look back rule. Okay, and this, of course, is going to apply in situations where employees are rehired after they're terminated or or uh, basically after any continuous period during which the employee is not credited with an hour of service. Now, we know, based on our 600 staffing companies as clients, our history in this industry, that very few staffing employees ever officially terminated employees uh, because you never knew if they were going to come back at a later date for an, another assignment. Well, well, this may this process may now have to start uh, uh, being tightened up on because now you have a, a length of time that you have to track while that employee is off assignment. And what this is for is whether or not if an employee comes back that you can treat them or subject them to a new look back period. And this is what this is for. So you can only subject an employee that comes back for another assignment as a new employee and therefore subjecting them to a new look back period is after that break is at least 26 consecutive weeks with no hours of service or six months. That's your standard. They have to be off your book for about six months uh, uh, before you can legitimately treat them as a new employee and therefore they go through a new look back period. But there's a second instance as well. The period can be less than the six months if the break is at least, is at least four weeks long but is also longer than the employee's period of employment immediately preceding that break. For example, if someone goes on a three-week assignment, then they would have to be off for six consecutive weeks before you could treat them as a new hire and subject them to a new look-back period. Otherwise, if the employees come back before any of those two lengths of time are met, then you're supposed to pick right up where they left off on their look-back period. Um, so that is another process in place that is going to have to be tracked. Uh, not only are you going to have to uh, take some uh, pretty extra care on your new hire practices uh, as employees are, are going through their assignments and then they have breaks in between assignments, those breaks will need to be tracked to see if they uh, trigger a new employee status because you will be in violation if you make someone go through their look back period again before their break in service rule has been met. So, uh, something else to keep uh, you know in mind there. Uh, the only exceptions to the break in service rules are, uh, you know, for employees of educational organizations or for special unpaid leave, as in teachers that are off for the summer, uh, things of that nature, FMLA, uniform service, jury duty, things of that nature. Again, here's another case study uh, example uh, directly from the IRS. Uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time on these examples, but just encourage you to go back and look them over uh, at your leisure. So, using the look back rule, okay, you need to be using the look back rule for previous years, uh, this year and the years prior, to estimate your full-time employees to get an idea of what your potential tax penalty exposure is. If you want to know what your uh, what kind of exposure for, for uh, these new taxes are looking at, you have to use these rules to figure out who your new full-time employees are. But if you're going to pursue some, some type of play strategy, um, the look-back rule will particularly need to be applied in 2013 because you need to start 
identifying who those particular employees are if you're intending on obtaining a, a quote for some type of, of MEC or other qualified coverage. Generally, from most carriers, census information and a three years claims experience is typically required uh, 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 for these types of uh, uh, quotes. Uh, so you'll need to have the who, uh, the Janes and the John Doe's, uh, who they are uh, when trying to go for some forward uh, with, a, uh, with a play strategy. So step three, to pay or to play. Um, large employers are basically required by law to either offer what's defined as minimum essential coverage, uh, qualified health plans to their full-time employees, or you must pay a penalty on each full-time employee less the first 30. Uh, for whatever reason, if you decide to go on a pay strategy and pay the penalty, uh, you know, if you have 100 full-time employees, you get to subtract the first 30. Uh, so you would actually be paying the penalty on the remaining 70 employees, and that's how you would calculate that particular cost. But uh, depending on what type of business you're in, uh, what type of employees you're staffing, the markets you're in, the state you're in, there are so many different considerations that that every employer must take into account besides the immediate financial one um, because it, it really is going to depend literally from employer to employer to state to state. Uh, there is no one-size-fits-all fit all solution here. Um, so what is the cost of the paying? I kind of already went over that. The tax penalty for not offering a, a, a MEC qualified health plan is basically $2,000 per year. But uh, always keep in mind the penalties are calculated monthly, um, $166.67 per month on each full-time employee, again, less that first 30. Um, there has been some talk out there from various legal counsels that uh, if a pay strategy is is, is looks like the best advantage for you. You probably won't have to pay the full 2000 because, honestly, how many temporary employees are working year in and year out? So uh, you will, your tax penalty will be assessed on, uh, on a monthly basis. Now, uh, if you decide to use a pay strategy, uh, employees will have coverage available from the subsidized state exchanges or state marketplaces, as, as what they're being called now. Um, and they face individual mandate penalties if no coverage options are affordable or available to them. But uh, it's looking like the state exchanges uh, uh, are all set to be open on October 1st. So there should be uh, options that are best, basically affordable, and depending on what their wages are in accordance with the federal poverty, guideline, federal poverty guidelines, they could have very generous uh, subsidized coverage, possibly even free coverage underneath Medicaid. Uh, again, the penalty is triggered when at least full -time, one full-time employee receives a tax credit or subsidy when they're seeking coverage from exchange. That's how they're going to know that you have X number of full-time employees is when the first employee goes to the exchange, seeks coverage, and, and, and uh, therefore qualifies for a subsidy. All right get to the next one. All right. Now, let's say you're offering coverage and considering dropping it. Well, there's a couple of things you need to keep in mind there. Uh, it could potentially weaken the employer-employee bond if coverage was previously offered. Uh, one of the big things that could affect this is non-discrimination rules. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is two-tier plans. Uh, it's quite common in the staffing industry that employee, uh, that a staffing company would have some type of uh, qualified coverage for their internal full-time staff in either very little or some other type of program for everybody else or for various other uh, uh, classifications. Um, uh, the non-discrimination rule could affect how that works, but we're not going to worry about that too much today only because the IRS has pretty much well uh, told everyone that they are not going to be addressing this issue in 2013. We expect maybe something to come out about it in 2014, but for the time being, it's really not going to affect your decision for uh, uh, today's purposes. Uh, but the most important thing to consider is your market considerations. What type, of, what type of workforces do you employ? Uh, are the majority of your employees higher paid, longer term? Or are you in much more lower wage, higher turnover style of workforce? What is it that your clients are really needing? Um, 
Some only want the lowest possible price. Some want uh, uh, you know benefits for these folks. So it really is going to depend on what your clients are looking for and, and the conversations that are being had there. Uh, that will probably be your greatest factor in influencing your decision. All right. Um, just to give everybody an idea of what the typical major med plans are costing out there, uh, this is a, a, a survey of all types of plans uh, by all industries, not just specifically staffing. Um, uh, the key thing we generally focus on is the very bottom one. It's an average of all of those other plans, HMOs, PPOs, point of sales, high deductible health plans, et cetera. Um, what you'll see there in the light green is what the typical average employer, employee contract contribution is toward either single or family coverage in a given year, and then you see what employers are typically kicking in uh, for single and family coverage uh, in a given year. Uh, so this is why you're seeing some very big companies out there taking a look at this, and they're like, okay, I kick in on average four to $5,000 a year on my employees' plans. Um, I've got very high participation. Uh, this, you know, this is where a $2,000 penalty on everybody may seem a little bit more attractive. So uh, just, you know, keep in mind that health insurance premiums are, are pretty expensive. So uh, don't feel bad if it looks like a pay strategy may be the best thing for your particular business, because there are a lot of companies out there that are going to be doing the same thing. All right. Um, Again, uh, this is just uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, uh, you know, don't have to spend a whole lot of time. It's pretty self-explanatory. Everybody's very aware of, of how much premiums have been increasing over the last 10 years, how fast they've uh, spiked this past year, and the probably increasing premiums that, are, that we're going to see going forward in the years to come. All right. So now we're going to start talking about the cost of playing. Uh, what are some of the advantages of that? Well, um, you may uh, maintain or inc increase some employer recruiting and retention abilities there. Um, you know, you maintain any and all historical benefits of offering employer-sponsored health coverage. But most importantly, it eliminates you either out of some or all of the penalties on your full-time employees, depending on which strategy you decide to pursue. But there are, just like every uh, choice out there, there's a disadvantages to this as well. Um, what is the cost going to be if you're able to offer a plan? Um, uh, we're seeing some pretty wildly fluctuating numbers out there in the various states uh, for qualified health plans, uh, you know, and some that are, are so cheap it kind of beggars belief uh, that, that we even think that this would be a, a ACA qualified program. So, but what do you expect that cost, whatever it is, uh, to do in the future? Do you expect to increase or decrease? Uh, that's a bit of a rhetorical question there given the slides you just seen from the national averages. Um, can you meet the uh, carrier requirements for offering coverage? Well, you know, Previously, uh, you know, the number one thing that, that kept carriers from writing major med insurance in the staffing industry were, were what's called participation requirements. Everybody agreed that in a staffing environment, participation would be generally low, uh, probably 10% or less. Well, carriers are no longer allowed to use participation requirements anymore in offering a quote. So by law, they have to give you a quote. But the only thing uh, the law does uh, does not say they can't do is how much they can charge. So it really will depend on whether or not how much the carrier is going to charge, whether or not it seems they actually want the business or not. There is going to be a cost associated with this, and it is a undefined cost. I don't care how you put it, but there is going to be a cost of a lot of the new administrative, re regulatory, reporting, and other. You are going to be the fiduciary if you use a play strategy. Um, typically in the past, uh, most everybody just went to their health insurance broker. I'm just going to offer a product uh, to my employees, and I'm pretty much well out of it. Uh, the ACA does not allow you to do that. That anymore. You become, you the employer also becomes a fiduciary uh, uh, re with responsibility in this area. So uh, the other thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, if you are going to use some type of play strategy, I would highly recommend that you hire a good ERISA attorney. Um, uh, this is going to be a uh, pretty much well uh, untried territory for the staffing industry, uh, based especially dealing with common law employment, co-employment issues, other 
other types of contracts that are about that we've seen out there in the staffing industry, make sure you get some great advice from a good ERISA attorney uh, when you explore this option. Uh, because if a challenge or a problem ever comes up later, you're going to need a good ERISA attorney to help defend you. So I uh, want to make sure that that is a pretty clear uh, uh, obligation there. Um, and then you have to look at some of your competition in the area. Will your competition have less expensive rates if only paying the tax in your particular market? So a lot of things to keep in mind there, and a lot of these answers to these questions are just not known. All right. So um, here's uh, another potential disadvantage is that there, there still may be a penalty of $3,000 a year or $250 a month per employee if coverage is even offered. Uh, if that coverage either, one, fails to provide minimum value, or two, it is not defined, uh, defined as affordable for these employees. Basically, whatever plan you offer, it cannot exceed 9.5% of the employee's W-2 wages. Uh, if the employee's cost is more than that 9.5% or the program does not provide minimum value, the employee can still go to the exchange and qualify for a subsidy. Um, and then in that case, the penalty for you is now $250 a month. The reason that seems higher is because if you offer some type of program, the assumption is you would have a lot less people going to the exchange uh, to qualify for a penalty than uh, uh, you know a, a, a flat $2,000 penalty on everybody for not offering something. So this is basically a new strategy that's been developed. It'll probably see a lot more of this. You may have heard about this uh, in the news, uh, the talk about what's called skinny plans or wellness and preventative programs. Uh, basically, these should qualify as what's defined as minimum essential coverage, but they wouldn't meet the test for minimum value. So, uh, But they would be very affordable, very low cost. Uh, so it looks like a lot of staffing companies and uh, a lot of folks in the industry may be looking for this type of play strategy as uh, something other than a uh, full minimum value option. Uh, the penalty is only applicable to the number of, again, employees who seek alternate coverage from the exchange and receive uh, some type of, of tax uh, uh, penalty credit. But whatever it is, assuming you had everybody go to the exchange and apply and qualify for a subsidy, your penalty can never be more than a $2,000 per full-time employee on everybody. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about these wellness and preventative plans. Um, it seems that they will qualify as minimum essential coverage. Of course, that's not been put in writing yet. Um, there is no doubt that these type of programs uh, do meet the legal hurdle for this definition. But uh, you know, the, the hesitation here is, uh, you know, with a lot of carriers and, and some folks, is uh, they would rather have it, it confirmed in writing before telling everybody this indeed is going to get them out of the penalties because the assumption is that HHS has a history of leaving things gray and coming back later and, and popping employers on it uh, at a later date. Um, the big assumption in there is uh, it's an unknown how many of your employees uh, using this type of strategy will go to the exchange and, and trigger a subsidy, triggering that penalty. Um, but it seems like a decent bet for a lot of staffing companies because these are uh, these are the the reasons why you wouldn't get penalized. Um, if your employees never go to exchange, decide to remain uninsured, never apply for a subsidy, you're not going to get a penalty on any employee that never goes. A lot of people don't expect that there will be a lot of people uh, uh, in these industries going to the exchanges. Um, if they do go uh, and they're based on their uh, uh, wage levels, uh, they are, they're eligible for Medicaid in your state. There will be no penalty triggered. Um, a lot of people that are working light industrial clerical uh, for folks that are very close to the minimum wage or slightly over or have a large percentage of those employees in their workforces, there's a good chance those people or those folks are going to qualify for Medicaid and therefore wouldn't ever trigger a penalty on you. Um, and if the employee is already covered under any other type of qualified program, uh, either a spouse or dependent coverage, military coverage, Medicare, et cetera, they would not trigger penalties uh, uh, for you in this scenario. So the only folks you would really be worrying about who's going to trigger a penalty are those employees that are not covered under some other type of program 
but uh, but are also are making wages higher uh, than would put them in Medicaid in your particular state. All right. Um, again, we'll come back to the non-discrimination rule. Um, this could have a lot of potential effect on everything later on. Um, it was always part of the ACA, but enforcement was postponed uh, until further guidance is being developed. Uh, basically, uh, if they enforce this, uh, it will require an all-or-nothing sort of attitude uh, for your employees. You would either have to offer the same group health plan for everybody or you got to drop your plan and send everybody to the exchange. So uh, because of this was one of the reasons why they figured they needed to look at this a lot more uh, in detail, and they've decided to postpone it until a later time. All right. So uh, again, just a quick little fl uh, flow chart there. Basically, you know, it all determined on whether or not your you, the employer, offers what's defined as minimum essential coverage, yes or no, what your penalties are, and then kind of a checklist to go through here uh, to see how everything would work and what your potentials are. Um, so regardless of which way you decide, pay or to play, know that all options involve paying something. Okay, whether you play or pay, you're going to be paying uh, in higher costs, uh, uh, lower revenue, and, and probably having to charge your clients more uh, for your, your contracts than you did before because everybody's costs, uh, every employer in the country's costs have just gone up uh, starting in January 1. So you can uh, either offer a MEC plan to only to your internal folks. Again, that at a later date, uh, that will be largely dependent on the non-discrimination rules. Uh, you could try to offer it to everybody. Um, you could offer some type of wellness preventative program uh, as long as it qualifies as a minimum essential coverage program. We Everybody seems to believe that it will, uh, just kind of waiting on some confirmation there. Or drop your health plan completely and send everybody to the exchange. But again, a lot of that will uh, play out a little bit later on because uh, a lot of it will have to do with the non-discrimination rules. A um, couple of things about the state exchanges. Uh, just remember, they're going to be set up in everybody's state. Uh, they are scheduled for open enrollment of October 1st of this year. Um, uh, nobody's going to be denied. No longer any pre-existing condition limitations. There are subsidies for every individual up to 400% of the federal poverty level. To kind of put that in perspective, 400% of the federal poverty level for a family of four is about $94,000 dollars a year. So quite a number of folks will be qualifying for at least some types of subsidies. And obviously, the closer you are to the federal poverty level, the uh, much more generous the subsidies are. Um, it's very uncertain how the exchanges are going to play out in the insurance market. Uh, uh, it's going to be a lot of a lot of uh, wait and see from a lot of the major, major carriers out there. Um, a lot of people were likely to purchase their coverage through the exchange uh, while in between their jobs and keep it. That's one of the reasons that they're being set up. Uh, uh, also know that they're going to have uh, uh, different levels called the metal levels, the lowest level being bronze, which is about it's like a 60% actuarial value all the way up to a platinum. Um, you may be hearing some things about private exchanges, but basically they're just insurance carrier product websites. Uh, you know, a couple of things to keep in mind there. If you see a, a private exchange has got a boatload of little carriers in them, those are generally weak insurance companies. Um, you'll see the bigger ones like your, your major nationals basically have a single carrier exchange out there, uh, those are probably may be your best bets from a private uh, exchange option. Um, here's uh, uh, from Aetna as of spring of this year. This is kind of where we are uh, in the types of exchanges around the country. As you can see, all the gray ones are, are, are the ones that have elected not to set up their own uh, state exchange and let the federal government do so. Uh, the bluer states are the ones that you will see uh, uh, that are developing their own. We've already seen rates come out from California, Ohio, and a number of other states uh, uh, on their exchanges. And the ones in green are going to form some type of, of, of 
partnership or cooperative exchange uh, possibly with some other states. So we're going to get uh, toward the end here. We're going to start talking about some uh, good strategic considerations, things to keep in mind as you move forward. Um, we highly suggest if you're going to uh, do any type of play strategy to make sure you have uh, some good advice. Make friends with a good ERISA attorney um, if you're going to have a, a, a play strategy out there to at least guide you on a lot of this uh, uh, because, uh, you know, we're in new territory right now. Uh, even as an insurance carrier representative, uh, you know, even the insurance carriers aren't fully sure what is going on. So don't feel bad if this is a confusing law to you. Uh, you've got some of the uh, major companies in this country that are still uh, very confused about how to deal with this law. Um, keep in mind that whether you decide to pay or to play, whatever strategy you decide, spread the cost of either your coverage or your penalties amongst all of your workforce. That is the advantage you maintain over your clients, okay? Um, your clients that you're staffing to will probably not have a much larger population of part-time employees to spread their increased costs are, cost around to. You will. So your value proposition should remain the same. Um, those companies we've identified out there that has a much lower ratio of full-timers versus not full-timers or part-timers will probably have a bit of a financial advantage over those companies that have larger full-time workforces comparatively. That's uh, one of the things is depending on what market you're in, what kind of staffing you're doing, um, uh, you know, uh, just keep in mind there, uh, companies that have say 75% of their workforce is part-time versus 25 that is full-time, well, they're going to uh, struggle a little bit harder than the companies we've seen out there with 5 or 10% of their workforce uh, qualifying as full-time uh, because they've just got uh, many more part-timers to spread their costs around to and may be able to develop a little bit of a cheaper rate. All right. Uh, everybody seems to agree that the need that for temporary staffing will still be strong. Um, you know, just keep in mind that your clients and everybody else is in the same exact regulatory boat, and they're facing the same costs and decisions. Uh, how you decide to handle that, and how you decide to uh, spread your increased costs around, will determine or whether or not uh, you're going to be attractive to your clients still. But we still think everybody seems to agree the advantage is still on the staffing companies on this um, uh, because you've got that advantage of spreading your labor costs amongst everybody. Your clients will not. All right. So address your market considerations based on your client needs. Uh, primarily, do your clients want the lowest possible turnover or do they want the cheapest possible labor cost? Depending on what your clients are wanting, that's going to give you the best inclination of, uh, of which way to go on this. Uh, if they want the cheapest possible labor, labor cost, well, they're probably not going to have a whole lot of full-time employee staff there. All right. Uh, that's the, po the only way to get the cheapest possible labor cost. Um, are your clients asking you, are you compliant? Uh, the law allows you to either pay or to play. You're, you are going to be compliant regardless of which option you choose there, and they're, they're going to be in the same boat. And it's going to cost more either way, so your clients will have to pay more no matter how much they may uh, you know, not accept a rate increase at this time, uh, all that. Uh, I think once every, everybody looks at the numbers, a staffing company is going to be much cheaper to be able to come in and offer a lower rate than your clients could be able uh, – than what they're going to have to pay the higher that person full-time now. All right. So uh, we think client education on the term compliant will be key to your discussions there. Um, some contractual considerations. Again, being subject to the ACA will result in a direct expense for a staffing company. Uh, make sure you're marking up your calculations for new business. Uh, that, you know, uh, uh, all – Calculation for new business should factor in this additional cost. Um, renegotiated contracts should be modified to cover this cost. And make sure you're modifying any contracts to add price flexibility if your direct costs increase, which they very well might in the coming years. 
um, especially if a lot of companies start outsourcing more and more of their full-timers to staffing companies. Um, keep in mind, CFOs are more likely now to be involved in making company health care decisions now than human resources. And, of course, this is all due to the increased regulatory and fiduciary responsibilities involved. Um, the decision to play and offer coverage will likely depend on the availability and affordability of coverage in your area uh, compared to a relatively easier option of paying a monthly penalty. Again, a play strategy could seem cheaper, but one thing to keep about uh, keep in mind about a pay strategy is, hey, you don't have to worry about any more burdens, any more uh, enhanced legal exposure, things of that nature. Uh, you probably won't have to worry about hiring a new ERISA attorney. So uh, both sides of the coin has their advantages and disadvantages. All right, some of the latest updates is, uh, again, additional guidance and amendments to the proposed regulation were released on December 28th of last year. Um, model notices have been released uh, to employers, and uh, they're expected to begin notification on or about October 1st of this year to coincide with the opening of the state marketplaces. Um, keep in mind a health retirement account will not qualify as coverage unless integrated with a qualified minimum essential coverage program and indemnity programs that are pretty popular out there for your part-time staff and, and true temporaries um, had to change to pay benefits on a per day per, pe per period basis instead of a per event. Uh, basically, no surgical schedules were, or, were allowed anymore on those types of programs. Um, again, uh, the, the big hearing that kind of started everything earlier this year was held on April 23rd. This is basically where they, uh, you know, address some of the concepts and where the concept of the skinny plan kind of came about was based on this public hearing. Um, you know, uh, uh, basically uh, the comments they received, of course, proposed regulations need further clarification, um, you know, uh, further guidance regarding seasonal employees and further guidance regarding dependent classifications were all part of this hearing in April. Um, you know, and again, uh, the industry and the lobbyists are, are, are petitioning uh, IRS to allow good faith compliance standards for 2014, meaning that this is such a confusing law, uh, uh, you know, they don't want too many people hurt, too many employers hurt, and they're hoping that the IRS will, will have a good faith standard for at least 2014 and not go so hard on the penalties on everybody. Um, and, and, of course, a uh, big gray area left out there is uh, regarding the impact of coverage on where the status of an employee changes, uh, basically from part-time to full-time. So here are some, some action steps, and we're going to end it here and start answering some questions. Uh, determine if you're a large employer. Uh, make sure you establish a look-back rule. Uh, identify your full-time employees based on that rule. Um, there may be some changes to the look-back rule in 2015, so make sure you're being very flexible in case you have to adjust some strategies here. Um, start uh, assigning someone in your organization to follow this law and to be very follow it very closely because regulations do come out on what seems like almost a weekly or monthly basis and something major could come out that you would have to address your strategies on. Um, and then once you do all that, decide to pay or play. Um, this is a decision you got to make over the coming months. Um, some time is getting a little short, but uh, always keep in mind that many considerations must be taken into account, uh, primarily your client needs, uh, how you deal with your increased costs, your various workforce strategies, health insurance, and pretty much what well, everything else. But uh, uh, to end with a silver lining, all still points to a strong demand for the staffing industry in the future. Um, and whoever you decide to go with, make sure that your vendor or broker has experience in the staffing industry and understands its unique challenges. Uh, we've seen a lot of crazy stuff out there over the past year and a half, and uh, just keep in mind there are, no, they are, there are no unicorns. Make sure you use common sense when deciding what to do here. Um, I, we put together a great resource section for you. These are all the various laws uh, uh, and regulations referred to in this in one place for you. Uh, uh, I know Shelly says she was going to send this out to everybody. Uh, it's a great resource, so we're going to go ahead and open up the floor now for questions. All right. Um, so, Shelly, how do you want to handle that? Do you want me to just – I see one there on the Q&A. Well, there's actually several, so I think what we'll do is have Amanda just go through these for you, and you can answer them one at a time. Does that work okay? That works just fine. Yeah, all I see is just one there on the Q&A. 
Yeah, she's got all of them here queued up for you. Okay, okay so the no first problem. One is, where exactly is the look back rule referenced in the bill or the IRS regulations? Oh, that was IRS Notice 2012-58. Uh, that was uh, released last year. Uh, there is a link to it in the resource section that has pretty much well, all those weird little examples and case studies you saw on this presentation. That's where it all comes from, and that is IRS Notice 2012-58. Uh, and again, it just uh, I should have it linked right there in our resource section. Hold on here. Uh, I want to say minimum value, minimum value. Maybe I do not. It should be. Hmm. Well, that's a good one. Uh, it, there's probably a part of that right here in this one, this regulation 138006-12. Um, that has a lot of employer share responsibility pr uh, uh, provisions there and probably uh, references that came out after 2012-58. So uh, I would certainly... Uh, you know, if just do a quick Google search on IRS 2012-58, and it should pop up. Great. Okay, so now we have our clarification question. Okay. If we have less than 50 W-2 employees, example, we have 40 W-2 employees and 45 1099 corp-to-corp -corp consultants for a total of 85 workers, we do not have any responsibility to the Affordable Care Act, assuming all workers are full-time. That looks correct to me. I mean, as long as they're under 50 on, on true W-2 employees and everybody else are 1099s, I think you're good. Okay. And the next question, what about full-time temp to perm jobs where the customer is expected to hire them in about three months? Would those employees be considered? Um, they are considered employee, but this is going to be a great key in your determination there about the variable and non-variable hour. And, and whoever asked that question has just stumbled upon one of probably the more popular strategies we're starting to see a lot of our clients take. Everybody that, that does typical contracts, tip to perm like that, you're sitting pretty. Um, that's automatically a variable hour employee uh, on their hire date because their contract is 90 days, three months or less, you know, uh, even if they're 40, 50, 60 hours a week. Um, and then they go permanent with your, your client after 90 days. You're pretty much well. I mean, that's. I mean, as long as you're documenting everything on the variable hour side, uh, that seems to be a pretty popular strategy we're starting to see out there to minimize that number of full timers. Great. Uh, the next question is, will headcount by location factor into large employer calculation? Um, yes. Uh, basically, getting back to that disaggregation rule, uh, it depends. I mean, I know there's a lot of franchise situations out there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, legal legal back and forth about, you know, hey, whether or not the franchise is corporate or the location is privately owned, depending on how that is set up. But generally, um, if a controlling organization and its member organization, if they can pretty much well tie you all together, they're going to tie you all together, and they want you tied together for the purposes of this law. It's uh, the way we understand it. It's going to be pretty difficult to set up a company where you know, uh, uh, you know, and it's something the IRS is certainly going to be look at, looking at from an enforcement standpoint on uh, you know getting out of the ACA, for so to speak. So yes, uh, I would certainly advise uh, speaking with the legal counsel there there to verify everything. But my suspicion would be, no matter how the organization is broken up, if there's some commonality to it all, that they would rather it be all together. Okay. And this one is similar to one that you just answered. If a temporary employee works for three months and is hired by the client, would they qualify as a full-time employee, or would they be part-time based on the look back of 12 months? Yeah, very. I'm like, if they're on your books for three months or less, and again, it will depend... Well, I guess maybe I missed the very first part of that. Let's go back to the initial assignment. How much was, how long was the assignment for, uh, depending on how you classified them for, you know, because that's your most important um, uh, point there on whether or not the employee is variable hour or non-variable hour, of course, being subjected to the look-back rule. So let's assume for the moment that that's, that's 
assignment was six months, okay, and full time. But if I understand the question, like maybe after three months the client took them permanently? Did uh-huh. I hear that part right? Yeah, yep, three months. Okay. So initially, yeah, uh, that employee is going to be determined as full-time because he's 40 hours a week. The assignment, initial assignment is six months or longer. So you're going to pay on that employee, you know, uh, assuming you use a pay strategy, I'm going to pay the penalty. You would pay for three months, uh, uh, that $167 on, on that employee. And then once they go over to the new employer, that's that's going to be their problem, not yours. Okay. Um, can you explain how to determine if you are a large employer or not? This is very confusing yet. Yeah, um, that is probably one of the, the most confusing things the IRS did was uh, tie two definitions, and they all use the same abbreviation, FTE. All right, so the one thing to keep in mind is, first off, the large and small employer cal- calculation is going to be totally separate from anything else you do. And this is where you're looking at equivalents, okay, your full-time equivalents. Basically, add everybody's hours up, all full-timers, part-timers, everybody. Uh, but cap everybody's hours at 120 so you don't throw off your count. Add up all hours in a given month, and you would divide that number by 120. Your result will be your number of full-time equivalents for that particular month. Okay, it could be over 50, could be less than 50, doesn't matter. What you do is then you do that calculation for each of the 12 months and come up with a yearly average. If your yearly average is 49 and under, you're a small employer. If your yearly average is 50 or above, you are a large employer. And you would do that calculation each year. Uh, It's the prior year's calculation that determines for the preceding year. So 2013 is what uh, your calculation for this year is what matters for 2014, and then your calculation in 2014 will be what matters for 2015. Okay. Will we be required to notify our employees of our decision whether we are going to pay or play? Well, uh, yes. Based on the model notices that were released, you have several different model notices to choose from. One is if you're playing. One is if you're paying. All of them, no matter what you decide to do, whether you pay or play, directs everybody to the state exchanges. This is These model notices are basically the uh, government's going to put the responsibility uh, uh, on you, the employer, for notifying your employees that the state exchanges are now open, and you're gonna, uh, that's going to be a part of that model notice, uh, whether you pay or play. So, uh, so yes, the, the new DOL uh, model notices are released, and I'm pretty sure that link was, there we go, model notice of employers who offer, who they don't offer coverage. Uh, if you have a COBRA election notice, there's a couple more there on, uh, uh, so you can go straight to those documents and download them. And you're supposed to start uh, sending out those model notices on or about October 1st. Great. If someone chooses to pay, can the $57.69 per week on a $3,000 penalty, can that be added as a surcharge to an invoice? Well, when it comes to. In the sales cost? Well, I, w- I would assume uh, this is just an assumption here, uh, but I would assume that you could pass your costs along however you want to, uh, whether you do it weekly, monthly, hourly, uh, however you want to do that. Uh, you know, if you're going to use that, I would suggest look at this uh, how you would pass the cost along on any other tax. Um, I uh, may be a little bit careful on line iteming it uh, and and identifying it as a ACA tax or something like that, Um, but pretty much, well, uh, you know, uh, however you would normally pass a cost increase along would be the general uh, way to go about it, I would think. I think a lot of folks are generally just going to renegotiate their contracts or, or, or factor in what their new hourly rate must be once they've kind of estimated what their costs are going to be and spread the cost amongst the entire workforce population. Okay. At the end of the year, if we have 100 W-2 employees but only averaged 40 in a given month, are you under the limit? Yeah. Uh, The way the law is written, it's a yearly average. Okay. 
salaried employees automatic, automatically count as full-time 40 hours? Yeah, that that would be a great assumption. Uh, that's why they kind of tell you to cap everything at 120 hours. Uh, let's say you had some salary employees. On average, they put in 160 hours. We well, don't, in that case, want to use their full hours because that would throw your count off a little bit. But, yes, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty much, well, full-time is full-time. And then that's another way you could do the calculation is say, hey, I've got 20 internal full-timers. I know I'm 20 over here. And then I just add up all my part-time hours and divide it by 120, come up with the FTEs for that, and then add it to my full-time pool. Now, I mean, however you want to go about that. But, yes. Okay. Uh I have. I was told to divide by 130. Where is this code in the IRS publication? Okay, you're you're to divide by 120 for the calculation. The, the number 130 comes up in the yearly or monthly average of that 30 hours a week. Um, if you do 30 hours a week and, and basically factor in, that's what you see, the average 30 hours a week or 130 hours a month. Uh, either of those two averages uh, constitutes full-time underneath the ACA. Okay. If you are trying to figure out if you're a large employer, would you need to total hours for 2012 to get the status for 2013? Or well, does it I mean, start only in 2013? Yeah, uh, according to the law, for this initial year, you can either use the full year of 2013 or the last six months from July to December. Uh, this is the only year that you could use either a six-month or a full year, year calculation. But a lot of companies have gone back in previous years, and it probably would be a great idea to see, hey, if you're close to that line, to see how uh, in given years, if you're going to fluctuate above 50 or below 50, it would probably give you some good historical data on how your business has traditionally run based on that average um, and then going forward. But but uh, to answer uh, the person's questions, it, it's, uh, the main deal is, is your this year's calculation for 2014. Okay. What do you mean by spread the tax penalty coverage amounts among all employees, including part-time? Okay. The majority of staffing clients that, that we have are pretty much well all, I would say, 85% of our client base is probably light, industrial, and clerical. Um, on average, again, this will be an unscientific survey, but for the most part, the general clients we're talked to, um, when they're using their look-back rule and determining their number of full-time employees, on average, I, I must admit, it's pretty striking how often we've come close to this number, but on average, uh, uh, of the typical client that we have, whether they are one of the large nationals or just have 100, 100, pers 100 people that they got out in the field there, um, uh, almost everybody falls in somewhere that their true full-time population is about 10 to 15 percent of their overall workforce. Everybody else is part-time or, or true temporaries. You know, the hours fluctuate too much. They don't meet the qualifications underneath the 12-month look-back rule, et cetera, et cetera. I've seen some instances where that percentage runs as high as about 25 percent, but most everybody falls in around that 10 to 15 percent range uh, of full-timers to part-timers. So, the entire law, and please, if you understand, God, take one thing away from this presentation, take this away. Everything is based on the number of full-time employees, uh, bona fide full-time employees that you have. Whether you pay or play, everything revolves around your number of full-timers. So let's say if 10 to 15% of your workforce is full-time, full you estimate what your, you know, it's pretty easy to calculate what your tax penalty would be on that number. You take that cost, all right, and you spread it around all 100% of your part-time, uh, full-time, everybody's hours. And what we're seeing in a lot of cases when, it, when staffing companies do that, um, generally a $166 a month penalty translates to about a dollar an hour increase if you're talking about one full-timer to one full-timer. But when you take that cost and you spread it around all of your workforce, we're seeing a number of staffing companies come up with about 18 to maybe uh, 10, anywhere from 10 to 18 to, you know, I think the highest I saw was about 23 cents an hour increase. 
which generally makes it a little bit easier to swallow and for your clients to swallow when you put it that way. Okay, so I have a question that says, specifically, multiple states, less than 50 in each state. And I'm taking that to possibly mean if they're wondering... If they, produce, if they have staffing in multiple states, if there's a discrimination, not discriminate, if there's a, a difference that employers in multiple states that look at your look back period, look at your qualification as a large employer. Yeah, they go all the way back to the to the common ownership there. Um, right. You know, if, if there's a commonality between all the organizations, they're probably going to lump everybody together, unless it's okay. a true franchise situation where the franchisee mm -hmm. pretty much has sole ownership. Um, but it depends on the situation they're in on, on a okay. lot of that. So what happens if you want to offer group health insurance, but you can't get enough employees to sign on? Currently with insurance companies, there's a sign-on percentage requirement. What happens if I can meet the requirement? Well, that is a major change that has already happened this year. Um, and, uh, carriers can no longer, I believe it's as of last month or, or the prior month, but it was pretty recently, um, they basically took the small group laws and, and made them transition up to large group now. So what that means is a carrier cannot look at your participation rate and deny you. Basically, they're required by law now to offer you a quote, and they can't take participation into account in that. However, however, I think Ed Lenz put this best, and I'm going to quote him on, on his uh, uh, webinar the other day, the law does not require the carriers to lose their shirt on a business deal. So what that means is they can charge whatever they want. So they got to give you a quote. There just isn't going to be any guarantee it's going to be cheap. And if you find out, you know, uh, you know, you may end up in, in some carriers in what I kind of call the, the 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 bureaucratic roadblock. It just may take forever for them to get around to your quote. <laughs> well, also, John, this is Julianne. Don't you feel that um, because there's many brokers and well, there's a broker usually involved um, to write it that they have to cover their commissions and their administrative costs? So. If your policy or program is very small, it's going to jack up your prices. Yes. And, of course, with this industry, everybody is going to assume a very low participation rate. And to be quite honest with you, that's what some of the brokers out there are hawking. You know, it's like, we're going to get you a plan that barely, you know, qualifies. It's going to be a very crappy plan, but it is going to qualify. And the plan is going to look so bad that nobody's going to want to enroll in it. Um, well, the, you know, from a staff and employer's aspect, well, hey, that may give them a little bit of a, you know, less of a risk on too many people signing on their plan. However, um, that's going to cause a couple of issues down the road. Um, you know, why would any carrier, any carrier whatsoever, want to go through all the trouble of, of creating policy documents, sending out ID cards, doing everything an insurance carrier typically does for something that nobody is going to enroll in? Okay, and then secondly, by following those, I mean, we're seeing plans out there that, I mean, my God, you know, $6,500 deductibles, uh, you know, uh, th I mean, which nobody making 8 to $10 an hour is, is going to want or take. Um, and, and the funny thing about that is because if that plan qualifies as minimum value and the employer uh, goes through the hoops and, and makes it affordable, but nobody takes it. Well, that just denied every single employee uh, their subsidy from the state exchange if they wanted to go get coverage from a state exchange. In those situations, and again, I agree, we are talking about a, a staffing and temporary industry here, but but the people we're talking about is your full-timers here. Um, their only recourse, if they don't like your plan, they don't want your plan, they would rather go get their subsidy, their only recourse is going to, to, is, is to quit. Yeah, I mean that's that's a, it's a weird it's a weird kind of situation, but I expect you're going to see uh, a, a lot of that pop up coming next year. John, two questions that I get all the time when I'm traveling to clients uh, on site is.
first of all, obviously the wellness preventive plans that if they do qualify as an MEC, first of all, can you offer those both to full time and, and part time? Basically, can temporary staffing companies just offer them to everybody? Well, it, it's yes, yes. The answer, the short answer to your question is yes. It, it really doesn't matter uh, who you, who all you offer to. You can offer it to the part timers as well. But of course, the way the law is written, what what kind of gets you into that lower penalty structure per se is you offering it to ninety five percent of your full timers. Now, right. those plans by by no means whatsoever. Everybody agrees do not meet the minimum value threshold. So. Right. But it does get you out of the two thousand dollar tax on everybody, but it then it goes to that three thousand dollar penalties on only those right. folks that actually go to the exchange and qualify for a subsidy. That seems to be what a lot of folks are interested in because you know one they don't expect a whole lot of people to go to the exchange either they're going to remain you know uh uninsured or whatever it is they're going to do there, but you know in a way it also kind of you know hey, if somebody needs to go get catastrophic coverage they you know it doesn't get them you know it doesn't deny them their subsidies from the exchange right right i think many people i'm talking to are looking at that so long as it gets passed that the i mean you know that um i guess that the h that the government accepts those because we don't know for sure in writing on that yeah i mean uh I'll be quite honest with you. We've got some pretty high-priced legal counsel and lobbyists that are that are talking with IRS, HHS, and DOL uh, as we speak, uh, and have for probably the past uh, uh, close to a year now. Um, and everything we're getting verbally, even the IRS admits that hey, uh, these plans are, are going to be acceptable. There, there's nothing in the law because of the way they wrote the law. They will be acceptable, but uh, our pressure, how what we're doing is pressuring them to come up with some kind of written clarification to protect our clients on it. Uh, it's just our kind of position is instead of selling it and keeping our fingers crossed that it's not going to get yanked, we prefer to have confirmation and then sell it. Okay, but the second part of that that we talk about, we have discussion on, especially for the employers that are light industrial and more, where they're putting 500, 700 temps out a week. The administration burden that's going to happen with determining full time versus part time. What they're thinking is that they offer this wellness preventive plan to everybody, yeah. all employees. That right. no longer will they have that assumed administrative burden of calculating all the time, you know, people's full basis full time and part time, assuming they understand the risk is the penalty if they go, if somebody goes to the exchange. Well, well, right, a absolutely, and and I have heard of that th theory before, and and it's I think it's perfectly acceptable, uh, uh, you know, to do that. Uh, the only problem I would say is yes, you don't have to worry about doing your look back and full time, you know, uh, uh, stuff as much, but you'll have many more people that you'd have to administer the plan for. So there is going to be a little catch there. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Certainly. Okay, we have a couple more yet. So, um, if we take the play, may we still offer different insurance coverage to in internal staff, or do we have to offer the play to company wide? Uh, uh, yes, you can. You can classify your employees differently. You can have two different plans now. This all goes back to the non-discrimination uh, uh, rules I, was, I mentioned a couple times in the presentation. Uh, that is the one thing that would cause you to do an all or nothing, and they decided not to address it and postpone it at this time. So we're pretty confident that uh, everybody will be fine throughout 2014, uh, and then we'll deal with it when they address it. Will you be but penalized of, if you – oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, as of now, yes, that's an absolutely fine strategy. Okay. Will you be penalized if you work an employee full-time for 90 days and then drop them to less than 30 hours a week? And then drop them to less than 30 hours a week. Okay. Um, again, we're still kind of getting to your initial – classification of whether somebody's going to be variable hour or not. So to me, I was going to say it depends on that first assignment. Um, uh, again, as long as you can classify them as variable hour uh, based on their initial assignment and what the hours are, um, the look back period uh, you know, after that three-month assignment at full time is up. 
you're three months uh, and under, so you're still good on, on classifying them as variable hour. Um, uh, so whatever their hours are after that, they're still in their look back period. See what I'm saying? You, you still don't really make that determination until 12 months later, assuming they're still an employee. But I would caution people, John, on the fact that there don't play around with moving people just to um, to um, avoid the ACA. Avoid yeah. the yes, and I think that's maybe where the question was going to sound like is that we. I mean, there has been um, notice out there that they will go after employers who are playing with um, employees' hours just to get them outside of the large employer or have to offer it as a full-time employee. Right. Uh, we're catching a lot of word uh, uh, on our end as well, a lot of it directly from the government agencies we're talking to. We know for a fact that they've hired, I believe, 9,800 new IRS agents uh, for enforcement thus far. Uh, I think the goal is 16,000 uh, before it's all said and done. Um, we're hoping that they have that good faith uh, 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 provision for at least 2014, but we expect some tightening up on enforcement uh, after. 2014. Be very careful there on whatever reports that you could be using from any various vendors. Uh, uh, you know, and you know, obviously, you know, if you're challenged or or com, uh, complained against for terminating employees before they hit their full time status after their look back period, and uh, uh, you know, using reports. Uh, it's already been said uh, from the legal community that they would take any employees, uh, any reports that you use, and you're terminating employees uh, prior to them hitting full. You know, that will be Exhibit A against you. So be a little careful there, and and also keep in mind uh, the ERISA violations, and this will be on on a type of a, a play strategy. Um, that's why I advise making sure you have some good friends with some ERISA attorneys there, because. You know, it won't be as bad if you do decide to do a, a, let's say, a pay strategy. You're not offering benefits, so the only thing you're really worried about is the ACA penalties there. But if a play strategy is pursued, and there are some shenanigans going on, or an employee just doesn't like you, or for whatever reason, you know, and something gets filed against you. Um, uh, you know, the ACA penalties, everybody keep this in mind, ACA penalties are chump change compared to ERISA penalties. Uh, ERISA penalties are $100 per violation per day plus the cost of any claims if that employee was sick once we're involved in health benefits. So just be pretty careful out there. That's why I would just tighten everything up. Um, uh, you're going to have to do that one way or the other, but especially uh, if you're going to pursue a play strategy there. Don't forget, everybody's so focused on ACA, they're starting to kind of uh, uh, forget about the previous labor law, labor and, and, and ERISA laws that are out there. Okay. Is 50 employees, does that mean per year or at one given time? Uh, that's your yearly average. If you elect to pay the penalty, $160 per month per full-time employee, how is that paid? Does the IRS bill you monthly, or is it determined at year-end on your tax return? The calculated for uh, the calculation of the penalty is for sure monthly. Um, there seems to be a little bit of uh, and a lot of assumptions going to be made about how it's going to actually be collected. Um, I would refer to, uh, you to uh, a certified CPA or, or other accountant uh, to answer that question. I'm not 100% sure if they've determined how this is going to be collected yet, uh, but uh, that community may have. Uh, but we do know for a fact that the penalty is calculated monthly. Okay. Will there be any requirements after the employee has been terminated with COBRA? Uh, well, all COBRA provisions will apply, uh, assuming a, a play strategy is in place. Um, uh, yes, uh, you know, obviously uh, the employee ha has to be able to continue the, uh, the COBRA coverage uh, after that. I do not think you have to, I'm pretty confident that you don't have to kick in your normal employer contribution for COBRA in that respect. Like, I don't, if they're unemployed and have gone on COBRA, you know, you're, they're no longer an employee, so you no longer have an obligation to them beyond the COBRA information there. Um, and again, that 
in my mind, I would say Cobra is probably not going to play as big a role, and this is just my opinion. Please take it with a grain of salt. With the exchanges set up and, and the ability for uh, people to get subsidized coverage to the exchange, uh, you know, kind of the purpose of that was to, uh, you know, allow employees to con- have coverage in between jobs. Um, I don't see why an employee would keep Cobra up at full price if they could just go to the exchange and get subsidized coverage. Um, but again, I think they'll have that right to, uh, assuming they want to pay for it. Can you pay a percentage of personal plans for your employees? This way the plan is more affordable than the group plan, and because everyone has insurance, the companies are not subject to penalties? And would you have to pay for part-time employees? Okay, uh, you don't have to worry about part-time employees. Uh, That's completely an employer decision there. Um, I would think... uh, that's a little bit tricky because uh, now we're talking about the way the law is written. Um, you know, you're supposed to be offered what's called minimum essential coverage, and, and what that basically means is an employer-sponsored program. Okay, so it, you know, a couple of issues there that may have something to do with it. But let's take uh, for argument uh, the assumption that that qualifies an employer-sponsored program. The program then has to meet minimum value requirements. It must have at least that 60% actual wearable value or higher, uh, and then it must be whatever percentage you're kicking in has to, uh, the, the employee's portion can't be greater than 9.5% of their W-2 uh, income to take advantage of the tax breaks. Okay. On what number will the federal government decide the penalty total each month? Uh, say that again. On what number will the federal government decide the penalty total each month? Uh, it'll be based on your number of full timers, uh, uh, less the first thirty. Okay. So, some uh, based on the reporting you're supposed to give the government, uh, the IRS involvement, and the employees going to the exchanges, they're supposed to know how many full time employees you have. And, of course, they can't do that unless you tell them. So, yes, you will have some pretty substantial reporting requirements. And then the last one I have here is please re-explain the look-back options for employees who work six months or less. Okay. All right. This all goes initially back to the variable hour definition. So that's the first key is that all starts in the new hire process based on the initial assignment. Okay, um, so let's say that assignment is six months, all right? Uh, it's pretty straightforward in the regulations that six months assignments are longer at full-time hours are full-time employees, therefore wouldn't be variable hour, so you couldn't subject them to a look-back rule, and their pay or play would begin immediately on their hire date, okay? Um, uh, and then I'm assuming the re- the quote uh, they worked their six months and then went perm. Did I understand that question correctly? Um, this one didn't ask about perm. Oh, okay, I- I'm sorry then. But uh, basically, when it comes to the look back rule. Um, is all determined on their uh, initial assignment, whether or not you can either subject them to a look-back rule. Um, But again, uh, your look-back rule is going to be decided by you, the employer. Um, uh, You can go 12 months. You can go uh, all the way down to three months, uh, depending on which you think would be more advantageous to your full-time employee count. Uh, But the, the general wisdom is the longer the better. Okay, and just to add to that, um, the person is indicating that most are 90-day contracts that sometimes go longer. Yeah, yeah, uh, that that should already be decided on that hire date, on the start date, because everything is based on the facts and circumstances of the start date. Okay. Do you know that um, how do you calculate the percent if individuals are compensated with commission and base? Can you estimate and adjust? To actual at year end. Hmm. Okay. Now that sounds like we're talking about wages here, um, uh, and I, so I'm assuming they're going to take a play strategy and they're trying to figure out how to get within the nine and a half percent. Yep. 
Yep. Okay. Um, you know, great question. I do not know that that answer off the top of my head, but I do recall in um, uh, the IRS notice that uh, the look back rule was mentioned, 2012-58. There was a, a few of those examples in there on how to uh, figure that out, uh, you know, based on commission and other stuff. I kind of just studied the staffing side of things, but uh, that, that's a great call. But I'm, I'm pretty confident there is an example on how to address that in those IRS notices. I'll try to find that for the person where it is. Okay, great. And then just a last clarification question. I thought the standard full-time employee was 40 hours per week. It's actually 30, correct? According to the Department of Labor, it is 40 hours a week. But that's the big deal in the ACA. ACA redefines full-time as 30 hours a week for the purposes of the ACA. Uh, so this is the only thing you got to, you know, it's only for uh, health care reform that you got to worry about the 30 hours a week. But, yeah, the person is absolutely correct. It was always previously defined at 40 hours a week, so this is a new thing. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions. All right. All right. Well, I'll, hey, I'll, guys, I got to tell you, I love getting the questions. It uh, means the audience was very engaged, um, you know, so I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I have more fun when there's lots of questions. <laughs> You know, thank you for your extra time today. We did go ahead and just open the poll. If you wouldn't mind um, giving us your feedback, we certainly appreciate it. Good. All right. Well, John, thank you so much for all of your time. Um, thanks again to the participants in today's webinar. We hope that you found the information of benefit and that answered a number of questions for you. John, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise on navigating the healthcare reform. The recording of the webinar will be available on our website, uh, tricom.com backslash resources. If you have any questions or would like a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation or the webinar recording, feel free to contact um, John, Amanda, or myself. Thank you again, everyone, for your participation, and watch for information on our next webinar session in July. All right. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. All right. Bye-bye.